Um, and so you obviously, to do first log, you have to obviously know what it is, but you're gonna have to make force diagrams to set up the equations. This is Newton's first law equation. You see that there's not a lot to it. And so the, the trick is going to be is can you apply this concept to whatever situation there is, understanding what are the forces and what direction they're acting and how they're acting. Um, but we're looking at equilibrium, right? And so that's all about balance. That started, started much, much earlier than um, this. Um, but really, it, it, the prior history is not, not as important. It, Galileo kind of had the, the initial ideas that Newton, I don't want to say he plagiarized them, but he definitely used Galileo's ideas in designing some of his stuff. Galileo had the idea of natural tendency of objects at rest, right? So what is the, if, when you look at something not moving, it means it doesn't want to move. And to make it move, you got to apply something, you got to apply an outside force to make it move. Then he said, well, if the object's in motion, um, it's because of its inertia, right? So uh, again, not knowing the complete history, I believe he was the one that came up with this idea of inertia, which is an Italian word and he was Italian, which is the Italian word for lazy actually. <clears throat> Right, and so inertia, and then that's also why Newton's first law, as you'll see if you didn't already see it prior, is sometimes called the law of inertia because the the wording is very very similar um, with Newton's first law in the definition of inertia, the natural tendency of an object to remain at rest or in unchanged motion um, in the absence of any forces. Right, that that's a Maybe a little confusing, but basically what it means is objects want to stay how they are. In order for that to change, we need an unbalanced force. We need some force to come in, apply to the object to change what it's doing, right? So I'm sure you, at some point, you've been sitting in a chair or a couch watching, you know, binge watching something, and your parents are like, go clean your room, go clean the bathroom, do your laundry, right? And you don't want to do that. And so how do, how do we make you guys do things? Well, we threaten you, right, with something, or we, we exert a force, right? We give you a swift kick in the derriere to, to get you off the couch, right? We need, an uns we need some kind of unbalancing force to, um, to, to make things change, right? You're driving your car along the road. How are you going to stop? Well, we have friction, right? So friction was that unbalancing force that many people, Aristotle and, and such, didn't realize, right? We talked about that with free fall. It's that unbalancing force um, to make things stop, right? And so engineers are like, all right, we, we, friction's, friction's a good thing, right? When we want to stop, but it's a bad thing when we want to make something go faster or work more efficient. And so engineers are like, how do we overcome this? Um, because friction's working against us. Um, and so Newton kind of stole some of these. No, I forgot to see if these are going to work. Let's see. No. I forgot to rehyperlink some of these. Basically, if you watch Simpsons, um, Krusty runs his car into a tree, right, and doesn't have a seatbelt on, so he flies through the window. I don't. Did I have? I don't think I had this. This I saved a couple of videos. Um, and I don't remember if this one was on there. Hopefully, this one works. All right. Let me. You know what, I think I hyperlinked them to the old PowerPoint and then I didn't do it to the new PowerPoint. Because I... Then we want to balance the glass on top of the quarters. And the challenge is to get the dime out from under the glass without touching or moving the glass. And no fair using anything else, you can only use what's right here. It may seem like a difficult challenge, but if you know the science, it's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is scratch the tablecloth. And as you do, the dime crawls out from under the glass. Seems like magic, but it's not. You just have to understand the science. And to understand that, think back to the very first science video that we did, experiment number one, jerking the tablecloth out from under the dishes. Right, maybe you've done this before. Because the same thing is happening here on a much smaller scale. When I scratch the tablecloth, I'm stretching it forward and it's pulling the dime with it. That's like pulling the tablecloth gently. Everything moves with it. But when I release, when I pull my fingernail away, the tablecloth snaps back. A 
that point it's moving fast enough that the inertia of the dime keeps it still. The same thing happens when you jerk that tablecloth out from under the dishes. So the dime sits still while the tablecloth snaps back. Scratch again, pull it forward a little bit, let it snap back. The dime sits still. Each time the dime moves a little closer to me until very quickly it moves out from under the glass. So the next time you're sitting there waiting for your meal to come, now you've got a trick you can use to amaze your friends. Then explain the science and amaze them again. Well, that's all for this time. Have a wonderful week. So kind of an interesting little uh, thing that what we will do, um, trying to figure out what will be our lab for just Newton's first law. Normally what we would do is I have stations set up around the room and you would, I have this set up, um, the tablecloth set up and you can try all these things. Um, some of the stuff you probably could do at home, right? Using stuff that's not breakable, obviously. Um, so maybe I'll try to figure out ones that we can do at home for you guys to do as our little activity before we would take this test next week. Um, but the idea is, as he, you know, he explained it to you, basically you're scratching this tablecloth and because of friction, right? So it's at rest, but the friction, um, because it's at rest, it's, it moves with the tablecloth. But when it snaps back, it's inertia, meaning inertia is based on mass. If you have enough mass and it wants to stay at rest, then when it snaps back, the friction that would drag it back is um, not enough and it stays stationary. Um, and it keeps doing that. And as long as um, you know it snaps back fast enough, because if it snapped back slower, then the, the dime would, would go backwards, um, but it snaps back fast enough, its inertia is great and it has enough mass, even though it's not a lot of mass, that it stays still. And then it keeps you know coming out as the way he shows you. So it's kind of a neat little way to uh, do that. And if you set it up, so this would be one of the things I think you could easily do at home is one of our stations. You put two quarters or something to elevate, it doesn't have to be a glass glass. It's nice to be see-through, get a plastic cup, which is what we use just in case somebody you know, knocked it over. Um, and it's an easy one to do as a little station, right? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip through these because I wanna make sure we get to some of the problems. And it's, you know, so the idea is here is you got a golf ball on a tee. Um, if you play golf, I, I like golf, I don't play it much anymore, but if the golf ball's sitting there, um, how are we gonna make it move? Well, we got, you know, it's inertia is it's at rest. It's gonna stay at rest. To make it move, we, we need to apply an unbalancing force. Right. And so this first law is all about balance. But in order to change something, we need an unbalanced force. Now, I like to use the idea of unbalanced. Sometimes they'll use like some textbooks or um, videos you might watch, Khan Academy or wherever you see other things. They might use the idea of an outside force or an external force. Um, but it's got to be some force coming into the system. Right. So the system would be the golf ball on the tee. It's not going to move. It's never going to move. To make it move, something must exert a force on it to make it move. Um, and so you hit it with a golf golf club, right? That makes it the unbalanced force, right? Otherwise, it would sit on. So you hit it, and it goes flying down the, the fairway, hopefully far, right? But what works against it? Friction, right? And so we have sliding friction, right? That's when things are sliding across each other. Rolling friction, like a bowling ball, a wheel, right? And then we have fluid friction, could be air or liquid. Um, these are the different types of friction, which we don't really need to know right now. We just need to know what friction is. It's a force that opposes motion. Um, we don't have to do the fluid mechanics unit anymore, which we would, like I do it with regular physics because there's some fun little activities with Archimedes principle and Bernoulli's principle and flight. Um, AP Physics 2 does the Bernoulli or the, the fluid unit. Um, and so for us, it's really sliding and static friction. Um, obviously the caveman created the, the wheel because rolling friction is gonna be less than sliding friction. It's easier to make something roll than it is to push it if it doesn't have wheels, right? And then understanding what is static friction and slide. Sli sli now the other thing is sliding or kinetic or dynamic. They all mean the same thing. It's all, sl it's all friction that we have to overcome to keep something moving. Um, that, again, that doesn't help us when we're like, all right, so you use sliding there, but then the next problem uses kinetic. You watch a video on Khan Academy and he uses dynamic. 
it all means the same thing. Whereas static is, there, there's no other words for that. It's just static. Um, but it's friction that's going to cause this thing to right come to a stop. And then gravity obviously is going to pull it down. All right, let's see if I hyperlink this. So, you know, it was funny because uh, I was watching something the other day. Oh, I think I was watching the, the um, well, you know, yesterday was a crazy day in Washington, D.C. I'm sure you all saw that. Um, and so I was watching, like, and I don't watch politics at all. You know, I'm not into that stuff. Um, but one of the senators was talking about, and I can't remember which one, but he talked exactly about going to the moon. And I thought I was just laughing to myself because I knew that I was going to show you this. Because some people don't think we went to the moon. Right. If you're a conspiracy theorist, there's lots of great ones out there. And that's one of them is that people don't think we went to the moon. Well. So I'll show you the video and maybe you think they they did it in, you know, some movie theater in L.A. Um, I tend to think that we went to the moon. Yeah. All right, where'd it come? This so I think I don't think it was the same one where they dropped the feather and the hammer. Um, and honestly, I forgot. I forgot which one this is, but they they hit golf balls. Good point. You can see the quality of this video is. Poor, but this was probably in the what the 60s. Hi, hi. Fredo, uh, trick me now. Uh, Mag Kilo Kilo had never been used. Is that correct? Stand by. I mean, look at the bulky suits and those big packs there. Oh, uh, yes, and while you're looking that up, you might recognize what I have in my hand is the uh, handle for the contingency sample return. It just so happens to have a so bulky you only can swing with one hand. And I think it was a seven iron that he used. Miles and miles and miles. So the idea is that apparently I don't I forget how many miss, missions we went to um, the moon, but apparently every astronaut that went up there hit golf balls and they, they don't retrieve them. So um, it's been said that if you have a really good telescope, I don't know how good the telescope would have to be, that you could see that there's lots of golf balls sitting up there. Um, but this is this was a picture after um, he hit, right? And so because gravity there's so much less, right? It's said that if you if you hit it at that optimal angle of 45 degrees, it could go about two and a half miles. Uh, could be in the air for about 70 seconds, right? Which would be pretty impressive if you're um, I guess it was a six iron shot, not a seven iron. Right, and that was uh, Alan Shepard who did that. Right, so what is equilibrium? It means the net force, right? So we talked a little bit about that last class, net force, sum of the forces, resultant force has to equal zero, right? It's all about balance. Everything adds up to zero. Right. And that's why, I, and again, remember I told you guys, I don't like just F equals zero. And that's probably how you're going to see a lot of people write it. Um, but I, I like to add sigma because I hope that you're, when you look at it, you're like, oh, there's more than one force. Especially when we get to F equals MA, that's, a, that's even more important an idea. So if it's static equilibrium, which is what we're going to do next class, if you want to be a civil engineer um, or, you know, an engineer, generally if you, a civil engineer deals with 
things not moving, right? You're, you're building a, a building, you're building a bridge, you're building something to protect something. Normally those things are not moving, right? When you guys drive over a bridge this week at some point, I'm sure you will, think about if the bridge started moving as you drove over it, right? You don't want that to happen. And so we're, as a civil engineer, we're designing concrete and steel things so that the things don't move. If you're a mechanical engineer, then you, you're, you're dealing with processes where things are moving and probably moving really fast, but we don't want them to accelerate. Um, and so you think about any machine that you turn on, right? You turn on your blender, you turn on any, any kind of machine and you hear it start moving, right? But then eventually it gets to the speed that you want it at and it just moves at that speed. Um, and then it's in dyna dynamic equilibrium where the velocity is constant. So if it's not moving or if it's moving at a constant velocity, the forces on it are equal to zero. That means we have balanced forces. And so it's either static equilibrium, it's not moving, dynamic equilibrium, the velocity is constant or uniform, right? And those are the two cases, which is why on that force diagram stuff, I, I put the part like, is it an equilibrium? Because I, I know you guys know what equilibrium is from all your other science classes. Right, but now we're just applying instead of like thermal equilibrium, you learned from probably Mr. Hurt, you put two objects together of different temperatures, they're gonna come to the same temperature, right? They've reached a thermal equilibrium, right? And so we're looking at forces. This one's not gonna work either. This one's funny. I gotta make some of these work for you guys because Homer, Homer walks around this and he's trying to hurt himself and then he realizes that's probably a bad idea. All right, so this I'm going to skip through because this was in the pre-lesson, and it's just how what Newton did differently than other people, and it was all about how he viewed things, and he was one of the first ones to kind of, obviously Galileo did a lot with space, but his idea was, he's like, if things work this way on the earth, then they probably work this way in space as well, um, and that was kind of the different, um, I guess, the leap forward that other scientists had made at the time. Um, and so what he believed, what happens on the earth happens throughout the universe. And then this whole idea of, did the apple really happen? People have, have um, I don't want to say that's a conspiracy theory, but it's kind of discussed whether or not that was a real incident that happened, um, or if it's just one of those things that gets passed along. Um, but he didn't agree with certain parts of what Galileo had said, and then he came up with what we know to be this, Newton's first law of motion. Now, you can state it in a, um, a, a simpler way if you want to. It's, I'm not going to ask you to, well, I say that it wouldn't be on the test, maybe on the quiz that we would take on Newton's first law, I might say state Newton's first law to see if you've actually remembered it. Um, but on any standardized test, college, AP, what have you, they wouldn't ask you to regurgitate the definition of uh, Newton's first law or really any of the laws, um, but it's the application of the first law, right? That's the important piece. And so there's three pieces to it, right? An object, in, so you don't need to add the word state if you, because I usually don't. I say an object at rest will remain at rest. So that's the first part. An object in motion will remain in motion with constant velocity. That's the key, because if you don't say that, then you're opening up the idea that it could be accelerating. And that can't happen with Newton's first law, unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. If you don't like unbalanced, you could say external or outside force means the same thing. Um, and again, like I said, it's when you look at the definition of inertia, it's, it's really similar to what Newton stated as his first law. And so it's the application of the first law that we that we're really um, looking at more than can you state it? Now, this application doesn't necessarily have to be just in problems. It could be a, a situation, and you have to explain how Newton's first law is working for that situation. And so on the homework for next week, um, I think there's like three or four. I, I, there was more. I, I cut them, I've been cutting down the homeworks to make them a little bit shorter. But there's like maybe there's only two or three situations where this situation works based on Newton's first law. And so can you then explain it? Right, here's that idea of a couch potato. That's where that comes from, 
right? Have you guys heard of that couch potato? It's like on we on Sunday, I'm going to be, a, well, once I take Dakota to soccer and come home, I'm going to be a couch potato. I'm going to watch football all day. That's my goal, right? I'll do schoolwork in my chair watching football. Well, I know this one's not going to work then. Darn it. This one's good because they, they freeze over um, the school and then they skate around the school. Right, and this is the this is the misconception. People think there's a force required to keep an object moving. There's not. There's a force required if there's friction, but if there's no friction, right, then there's you don't need a force to keep it moving. It'll keep moving until it runs into something. Um, but it's because people can't see friction, right? If there's no net force, it can't accelerate. It has to move at a constant velocity, which means it can't turn, it can't speed up, it can't slow down. This is when we get into rotational motion or circular motion, this will become evident why it can't turn. Because whenever something turns, you need an unbalanced force to cause that to happen. Right, and then I showed you guys, I think I, you had the car, right? And so here's like a situation, which I don't know if I can make animated things on quizzes and tests. I'm gonna have to try that. Like if I put this picture there and exp say explain what happened, well, he's, he's on the motorcycle, so he's got, the same momentum, right? The same motion as the, mo the motorcycle. But when the motorcycle hits the wall, the wall's exerting a force on the motorcycle, stops the motorcycle. Well, what's the force that's stopping the guy? Nothing. And that's why he goes flying over the, the brick wall, right? Say so that's the whole reason why we, you know, engineers made seatbelts and airbags, Newton's first law. Like when we stop a car in a car accident, how do we stop our bodies? Because we're moving as fast as the car. Right, brakes can stop the car, but what stops you? Um, you know, you put something on your seat and you slam on the brakes, right? If, if there's not enough friction, the thing's gonna fall onto the ground, right? I, I used to happen to me all the time driving up 28. I have my bag in the front seat. It's when Dakota would be in the back seat because she's too little to sit in the front. And I'd have, you know, you're driving along and you gotta start and you gotta stop and you gotta start and you gotta stop. If you're going fast and all of a sudden someone in front of you stops, everything flies off the seat. Why? Because it's, it needs an unbalanced force to stop it. And if friction is not big enough, then it's going to move, right? So being able to uh, explain like those kinds of situations here, you, you think about all the, the big white bands we have with ladders on top of them. What if one day someone is like, hey, make sure you secure the ladders. And the guy is like, yeah, I thought you did it, but no, nobody did it. And they're driving along and they come to a stop and you're sitting here parked at a, at a, stop sign or stoplight and you know maybe they hopefully they don't hit you but the ladders go flying right because they weren't secured down they're moving they have inertia they're in motion they want to keep moving you need a force to keep that from happening same thing here you got this car is not moving it wants to stay in motion well why does it move forward well because this truck exerts an unbalanced force on the car to make it move right think about you inside the car right what, what would happen to you if you've ever been rear-ended before in a car, hopefully not, you get whiplash, right? And so think about what whiplash is, right? That hurts your, usually you get, you're like, you're wearing some brace around your neck and you're like, yeah, I got whiplash. Well, people normally think your head is snapping back, right? But think about it. If you're in your seat right now and somebody hit you from behind, your head technically snaps back, but really it's not snapping back. Your body's moving forward. Your head's trying to stay where it was right? Your head is, your body's at rest. It wants to stay at rest. I'm sitting in my chair. You guys can all see the chair, right? The chair, I don't have a headrest on my chair. And so if somebody comes up behind me and pushes my chair, my body's going to go forward because the chair is pushing my body. But my head, my head, other than me straining with my neck muscles to keep it stationary and move with my body, it would stay, it would want to stay where it was, right? We call that whiplash, but it's really just the inertia of your head trying to stay where it was, right in your body going forward so just understanding those kinds of things conceptually how newton's first law comes into play right if you uh, um back in the i don't know if it was the 90s but the 80s they used to do commercials with um crash test dummies you can probably watch those on youtube they're kind of funny all right so let's let's look at a problem or two starting out easy I you know what i oh i did look at that i finally remembered to make one a slide to write on. So I can't, I try to come up with the easiest possible situation there is. Um, basically, you're, you have a box on the ground and you're pulling it. 
Um, it has a mass of 50 kilograms. Um, it's moving at a uniform or constant right velocity, which is important for the first law. Um, the, the force is horizontal. Um, and I give you what friction is, right? So in the beginning, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, the problems are going to give you friction, but then once we um, get a little bit farther, we're going to use that equation for friction, which I've shown you a couple times, how to calculate friction. Determine the pulling force and the normal force. All right, so this is what you do. First thing, make your force diagram somewhere. And get, or you can draw it on the box if you want to. Um, I'll do it right here. I don't know why it's doing that. It could be because of your hand. Like you might be laying down your hand and all of a sudden it like takes it. Yeah, I think you're right. Point. But it shouldn't be that sensitive. I mean, it seems to be getting worse, I guess is the idea. And it's hard, it's hard to, um, wait, I don't know. Maybe I just got to get a better one. I don't know. <laughs> all right. So we're pulling to the right. See there, my hand's completely away from it that time. And it didn't do this before. Now it's doing, it seems to do it all the time. All right, so it's not gonna be good because I'm trying to be very dainty here. Um, so you're pulling the force to the right to the right. We know that there's gravity down. Normal force is up. I know the normal force is going to equal the force of gravity because it's not moving in the Y plane, right? And then it tells me there's friction. And even if they didn't tell you there was friction, right? Or they, um, you, maybe we had to calculate it. You, by looking at the problem and knowing that there's an applied force to the right and knowing that it's moving at a constant velocity, that, that means there has to be a force to the left um, to balance it. Otherwise, it's going to accelerate, right? And so... That's how you would have to kind of figure out, man, that's a term, right? What the force diagram would look like if that were, even if the words were not given that there was, uh, was or wasn't friction. So you make your force diagram. So this is the key. We start out by writing this. Some of the forces in the X direction, I'll do Y over here so I have space. Some of the forces in the Y direction, they both equal zero. Right, and once we get into Newton's second law, you're gonna see that one of them is gonna equal MA. Rarely do they both equal MA, um, but they both can equal zero. Um, but when we get into the second law, one of them is still gonna be equal to zero. Right now they're both equal to zero. So now here's the key. You use your force diagram to make this next step, right? So you're looking in the X direction, right? We know this is X, we know this is Y. So you take forces to the right, because right is positive, left is negative, right? So this is to the right, it's positive. So I say F minus any force to the left equal zero. That's how I make my equation, right? And so again, we're starting really easy. You might be like, and, and I know some of these problems are really easy once you do this, you, could, you probably looked at this and said, well, F is 15, right? But we're, we're trying to, the idea is we're trying to start with a really easy problem to learn the process so that when we get to problems that we need to get to that are a lot harder, you understand how to set them up, right? So that, that's my, I've made my equation. That's the key, right? And it's every time you do this, it's different because the forces could be different. In the Y direction, I have the forces up minus the forces down. So the normal force is up minus any force that's down equals zero. And now I've made my equation. That's how we, that's, you know, that's how we make these equations and they're gonna be different every time because the forces are gonna be different. They're gonna they'd be different sizes. They're gonna be in different directions. Once we've done that, now it's just algebra. You're really done with all the physics. Right? You say, okay, well, what are we trying to find? We're trying to find the pulling force. So the pulling force is going to equal the force of friction. Right Now, again, normally, once we get past the beginning stages of this, this won't be given. We're going to calculate it. So it'll make it a little bit harder. But right now, we know that that's 15 newtons. So F has got to be 15 newtons. 
right? There has to be balance in the x direction because it's moving in equilibrium with a constant velocity. Well, what about the y? Well, if it's not moving in the y, then we know that all the forces have to be balanced and there's only two of them, so they have to equal each other. Now, how do we calculate the force of gravity, right? Maybe this is the hardest part of it, it is the formula is on your formula sheet. It's just kind of hidden, not with um, the stuff that we're, you know, we're doing right now. And it's written um, in terms of G, where G equals the force of gravity over M. But the force of, to calculate the force of gravity or weight, you simply take the mass and you multiply it by G. Again, we can use 10. We want the masses to be in kilograms, remember, not grams. So if it was in grams, you got to convert it. All right, and we get 500 newtons. Questions on that? Yes, the flamboyant F. I'm behind your chatting, Dakota. Okay, good question, Brendan. He said, why, why, would that, why, why am I not going to put a negative sign right there? So here's the deal with that. Forces cause accelerations, right? So this force causes this acceleration. So you only want to make something negative one time. And so the way I've always done it is I've always um, included the direction when I made my, when I do this step right here and when I do this step right here, because friction is a normal, usually a negative force also, because it opposes motion. But instead of putting in the neg, because friction has an equation that, you know, that we can calculate it externally and plug in the number. So what I do is I take into account the direction when I do this step. And so since the force of gravity is a downward force, I made it negative here. And so the, the equation itself, gives us the magnitude. So by us previously putting the, a negative 9.8 in here, we were including the direction with the acceleration. So you either want to do it with the force or the acceleration, but not both, right? So you want, when you, when you think about the direction of something, as I did here, I, I included the direction with the way the force is acting, which was down. I don't want to do it again because I've already done it once. Does that make sense? So when you're doing this, um, usually it's this situation, but it could it could be with a, a just a, an acceleration. You only want to include the direction with either the force or the acceleration, but not both. So what I could have done, I could have said Fn plus Fg and said, well, all right, sigma means sum. I'm going to add all the forces. The normal force is going to be equal and opposite to the force of gravity. And then we know that's going to be mg, right? 50 times negative 10. But now I put in the negative here because I didn't include it here. But there's a negative and there's a negative, which still gives me the same answer. So you either want to um, take into account the direction in this step or you want to plug it in later. I like to do it in this step. It's a, I don't know, it's a matter of preference really, I guess, how you wanna think about it. All right. Technically you guys are done with the class, but I, I'm gonna do another problem. So you can, I had, um, do I, I had a couple problems situated, um, but let me, let me do this one because this is, so if this is, this is the easiest possible problem that we could do. We have one force in every direction, they all, in every direction, there's equilibrium. Um, to take that one step farther, what's the next easiest or hardest type of problem? All we do is we now, instead of take that force in the X direction, we apply it at an angle. Everything else stays the same, right? But it changes the problems, and that's what I, I want you guys to see is that it can, it can ramp up the difficulty fairly quickly, all right? So if you got to go, you, you don't have to stay if you don't want to. Um, this will be the last thing I'll do. I just want I want you to see one of these problems. Um, 
also the um, I sent you guys out a why is it doing that? I sent you guys out a um, Canvas message. Wow, this is interesting. Yesterday I talked, to, I graded your test so you can see your test grade. Um, I kind of, cause some, I don't know why, but some of you guys still don't know what the test correction policy is. So I wanted to make sure you knew what that was um, or the retake policy process, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, and so I was after school yesterday. I was there this morning and I'll be after school today. Um, but I'd like you guys to, just so that we're staying current um, and we're a small class and I graded all your guys' stuff first to do the retake on Monday. So that way it's, um, you know, fresh. But just make sure that, you know, if you if you want to do it, most a lot of you guys did really well, especially on the horizontal part. The angle part is always a part where there's a slight drop off, but that's not true for some of you. Um, you did better on the angle part, which doesn't always happen. Um, But um, if you want to do corrections, that was the, I wanted to make sure you guys knew that because you got to make sure you've completed all the formatives, done all the homeworks, done the review, all that kind of stuff. All right, so um, basically here's my force diagram. Ignore this crazy line there. You've got, right, th instead of being this direction, now it's at an angle. So what that means is we have one force that acts in two directions, right? It acts in the Y, the X direction, but it also acts in the Y direction. So what we have to do is we have to break that force into its X and Y component. And this, this step that I'm showing you here is exactly what we did. Think back to this being the initial velocity. And this is VX and this is VY. It's the same step, but now we're doing it for forces. And so this is the force in the X direction that this guy is applying. And this is the force in the Y direction that this guy's applying, right? And this is the angle of 60 degrees. Right, so here's my force diagram, but any force that's not exactly in the X or Y direction, you're going to want to make a right triangle out of it, right? And we have the X and Y component. Now, the next step is the same. Some of the forces in the X direction. Equals zero. Some of the force, you always start out with this. Okay. Now, what you do to make the next step, we, we look at both of these things. We say forces to the right. Well, we can't say F minus friction this time because F is acting in two directions. So you have to, for the, for the moment, you have to ignore this and think of these two things as replacing this. So I say the, for, the amount of this force in the X direction is F of X. Right? It's the X component of that force. Just like the X velocity was for the initial velocity, this is the X component of this applied force. Um, then minus friction equals zero. Okay. In the Y direction, right, we have the normal force up, but we also have part of this guy's force up. So we have the Y component of the force plus the normal force, right? Minus the force of gravity down, right? So what's different between this and the other problem is we, we had F here before, now it's F of X and we didn't have this right before in the previous problem because we were pulling horizontally, but now you're pulling in two directions at the same time. So we have to break that force into its X and Y component. Now, if you look at this, we have two equations. You guys learned in math class that if you have two unknowns, you, can, you need two equations. So if you have three unknowns, you need three equations. We only have two equations, but we have a lot of unknowns right now. So we can't, we can't solve this the way it looks. So this is where the trig comes into play, right? So again, just like when we did VOX equals VO cosine of theta, right? VOI equals VO sine of theta. We're doing the same thing. We need to get rid of this in this, because this is an unknown. This is given as 45. This is an unknown. This is an unknown. This is an unknown. This we can calculate because we know the mass. So we have one, two, three unknowns and two equations. We can't solve it. So we got to simplify it down to two unknowns. 
To do that, we're using trig. We say the cosine of 60 equals adjacent over hypotenuse, right? Cosine is adjacent. So that means f of x is equal to f times cosine of 60. And we want to substitute that in right here. So I want to substitute in f times cosine of 60 minus friction equals 0. Now I want to do the same thing with y, right? And I know that y is opposite the angle, so it's the sine of 60 opposite over hypotenuse. And so Fy is going to equal F times sine of 60. And so right here, get rid of Fy, we're going to plug in F sine of 60. Everything else stays the same. Right, and then this is the step we got to get to, because now, well, if you look at it, we have 45 newtons, unknown, mg, which we can calculate, unknown, unknown, but it's the same unknown as this one, right? So F is an unknown, it just happens to be in both equations and then the normal force. So this, once you get it to this point, it's just like in math class when you guys, you know, did um, X cosine of 60 minus Y or minus four X sine of 60 plus Y minus 10 equals zero, solve for X and Y. That's all you're doing, right? It's the, that, that math. And it, it doesn't look like that, but that's what you're doing. Um, well, we know this is 45 newtons, right? So let's solve this for F. I'm going to add friction to the other side. I'm going to divide by cosine of 60. And make, make sure your calculator's in degrees, right? That was given as 45 newtons. Divide that by the cosine of 60 which I believe is at 0.866. I haven't done any trig in a while. No, it's 0.5, right? So I know I should know that. But. So that's 0.5, so that gives me 90 Newtons. Right, now that I know that, I can substitute in the 90 Newtons right here, right? That's why I had to solve for F first, because over here I have two unknowns. Well, now I know that's 90, so I'll solve this for the normal force, right? In the previous problem, when you're pushing or you're pulling horizontally, we know the normal force equals gravity, but now it's going to equal the force of gravity minus that force that you're applying times the sine of the angle. And so how much less the ground is going to apply is equal to how much that force is. Right, and the, the closer this gets to 90, right? 90 means you're pulling straight up, right? If you're strong enough, you're gonna pull it off the ground, then the ground's not gonna pull, you're gonna do it all. The ground, the normal force would be zero. So as you increase the angle here, the normal force is gonna decrease because this is mg, right? We know this is 90, so I'll, you could skip this step, right? And kind of plug in the numbers. 125, that was given. Oh, I have to write very deliberately now. Minus 90 Newtons, sine of 60. Right, again, you, I, I would normally skip some steps here if I was working out this problem on paper myself, but I don't want to do that for you guys. So obviously sine of 60 is 0.866 times that by 90 gives me 77.9. So let's just call that 78, right? And so the ground would normally, if you were pulling horizontally, the ground would have to push up with a force of 12,000 or 1,250, but it can do 78 less. So it's really just 1172 Newtons. Right, because some of your force is acting in the y direction. Questions on that? Um, wouldn't 
f of x equals to 45 newtons because 45 minus 45 equals zero. Um, so I said it again, f of x equals 45 newtons because? Because the f of x minus f of, like the friction equals zero. And it since would, we know that it, it, yeah, it would if you were pulling horizontally. But because you're pulling at an angle to achieve the same um, overall situation on this cart, um, because you're pulling at an angle, you, you have to apply more force because now some of your force, if you think of it as kind of like your, if your goal was to move this thing to the right, well, the optimal way of doing that is pulling exactly to the right. But since you're, you're physically can't, I obviously do that because this guy's too tall. He's pulling at an angle. He's going to actually have to apply more force to achieve the same outcome. Um, and that's why this F is greater than 45. If his, if the angle was zero, like the pr this previous problem, right? When we did this problem, that angle was zero. Cosine of zero is one. That's why I didn't put F cosine of zero because we didn't need to. We know it's one. So as you, as this F, as your force here, the horizontal force starts to go up at an angle, it this force to achieve the same result is going to have to increase because you're you're getting more of your force away from the way you want the object um, 